Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. I wanted to do this quick little follow-up before I move on to the this video about uh, Tracy Brony. It was um, in the podcast that I listened to a lady that they spoke to who had been a relative of um, Simon Wilson or maybe his babysitter. I wasn't quite clear about that. She said that later on after he went missing, the family moved the sister, his sister, who was younger than him, to Belfast. And I'm not sure if the family left that town, if they all moved, if just the father or just the mother moved. But the family was originally, both parents were originally from Belfast. And so when they moved the sister there, Everyone just kind of speculated that it was possible that they had taken Simon there as well. Now you would think, now this was 1975, I'm not sure about record keeping and stuff about our airplane flights at that time, but you would think that there would have been some record of him in school there or something. So this very well could have just been a rumor. The family may have moved back to Belfast and taken the ch the uh, sibling there, or siblings. As far as I know, there was only one sister. Maybe just to get away from all these rumors and to not be there in that town where everyone suspected them. Another thing that I wanted to bring up as I'm getting ready to do this Tracy Bruni story was that uh, when, when the... Um, Ma'am started to record the podcast. He had someone reach out to him who had lived in that town at the time, was walking to meet their mother. And the way that they described the street that they had to walk on is um, there was no sidewalk on one side of the street, so you had to walk on the opposite side until you got to part of the street where there were sidewalks on both sides. So she's walking on the opposite side of the road on her way to this hill she has to walk up this street that's like inclined and her mother is going to be there to meet her so the, she describes this man in this green car who pulls up and leans across the seat now this was a, a car from back in that time in the 70s had a bench seat had the long seat so she said he slides across the seat and he asked her does she need a ride and she told him no she didn't need a ride he reached and put his hand on the door and opened the door and he and she said his demeanor changed and he became very um aggravated by the fact that she didn't just jump in the car and accept the ride and he said are you sure you don't need a ride and she said no i'm meeting my mother my mother's right up here at the top of the hill waiting for me and he slammed the door and like sped away. She could always remember that car. She could remember the color of the car, the sound of the car speeding away. Because it was in the same time frame that Simon had gone missing. And it was still fresh in everyone's minds about the danger of what could happen to kids. And, and after Simon went missing, parents started bringing their children to school and watching them a little more closely. So I'm just going to read from this website. It's called Nicole Investigations. Six-year-old girl found dead. Foul play suspected. 
This took place May the 15th, 1975. Metro police suspect foul play in the death of a six-year-old girl found yesterday in Etobicoke Creek, hours after her mother left her at school. Tracy Ann Bruni of St. Clair Avenue West was discovered at 1 p.m. in the creek near the bridge at Lakeshore Road. She was pronounced dead on arrival at Queensway General Hospital. Now, this is in Toronto, Canada. This is the same town that Simon Wilson uh, disappeared from. Uh, the girl's mother told police she dropped the child off at the schoolyard at St. Clair Separate School at 8.55 a.m. that morning. The school is on North Cliff Boulevard in the St. Clair Avenue area. The child was not in class when the bell rang at 9 a.m. The parents, Earl Chambers and his wife Merle, interviewed were interviewed by police that morning. After six hours of questioning, they were completely shaken. We have no enemies. I don't know why something like this could have happened to us. I keep asking myself why, said Mr. Chambers, a machine operator. Mrs. Chambers was still wearing a scarf over pink sponge rollers in her hair, trying difficultly to light a cigarette. She was such a good little girl, she said. I questioned her this morning, and she said she loved school. I don't know what to believe. I dropped Tracy off at 8.55 8, 8 that morning, seconds before the bell rang, but the child did not make it from the front of the school where she was dropped off at to class. So, according to the mother, the child didn't come home from, at 1 p.m., she was due to come home for lunch. Now, this may have been something that was normal for this school. I don't know. This was a five-year-old child. I don't know if children that young were just allowed to leave the school and go to try to make it home on their own to have lunch and get back to school in time. I, I, just, I don't know about that. This is a, what the mother said. The child didn't come home from lunch, for lunch, and she went to the school to look for her. I began to worry when she didn't come in for lunch, so I decided to walk down to the school. The next thing we knew, we were at the police station. Tracy was Mrs. Chambers' child from a previous marriage. Now, here comes my conspiracy thoughts, and, and I thought about this when I first read this story, was that the child had only been returned to her mother very shortly before this happened. News stories of the day recount that she was 10 months old when she was sent to live with her maternal grandmother while her mother, Merle, tried to establish herself financially. Her mom went on to marry machinist Earl Chambers, and together they had a daughter that they named Turi. In December of 1974, Tracy was brought back to Toronto to be reunited with her mom and stepdad and half-sister. Short five months later, and she was dead. So it makes you wonder, did something happen? Is the whole story about mom dropped her off at school, is that, is that all just part of a cover-up? While her husband was in the bedroom, Mrs. Chambers sat on the sofa with her face in her hands, talking about the cost of the funeral. I don't know where we will get that kind of money, she said. I don't know how we will afford it. Do you think the government pays for things like this? She said in a flat, emotionless voice. Why would someone do this? All the questions. Herbert Howard, who was the principal at the school, said last night that Tracy had only been a pupil at the school since April the 28th. So basically less than just around two weeks. She got along very well with the other kids, and she fit right in. She seemed to enjoy school, and her teacher said she was a good student. The family's apartment, situated above a restaurant, was guarded last night by police. I, I guess maybe they thought that someone was targeting this family. 
Police went to the restaurant several times to question the staff and patrons. Inside the apartment, police searched every room. Is it possible that the mother did drop her off at the school and then go home, and before the child made it into the schoolhouse, she was confronted by someone and led away from the school? Police say the girl had been beaten before her death. So now she had been beaten, and whoever it was that beat her, she either was running to try to get away from them and fell into the water and couldn't get back up and drowned, or they put her in the water so that she would drown. Metro Homicide Police believe six-year-old Tracy Ann Bruni was severely beaten around her head and thrown into the creek. An autopsy revealed the child did die by drowning, but her body had been beaten severely, especially around her head. Her body was discovered by a 13-year-old boy named Mark Norrie. He was playing in the Marie Curtis Park when he noticed uh, the body it was in about 18 inches of water near the bridge. She was fully clothed, and according to the autopsy, she had not been sexually molested. She was found dead 10 miles away, so it, it's reasonable to believe someone took her there. I don't think a 5-year-old child could have made it 10 miles on foot. The plastic, the black plastic purse that Tracy had been carrying her lunch in. See, this is another part of this. Her mother said she didn't come home for lunch, so she was worried and went back down to the school to check to see why she didn't come home but yet she took her lunch with her to school in a black bag which is all the more reason to wonder if this was domestic something happened to her in the home metro police confirmed a black school bag found in a north north cliff boulevard backyard belonged to tracy Staff Sergeant Jack McBride of the Homicide Squad said there is no doubt in his mind that the plastic shoulder bag is the one Tracy carried to her kindergarten class that morning. The bag was found less than a block from the school. Tracy was buried at St. Anne's Church on Gladstone Avenue. About 35 people, including some of her teachers, attended. Police will canvass the residence on North Cliff Boulevard near the creek for leads. So far, there are no suspects. So now the, the reward rose, uh, the reward increased to $5,000. I personally, and this is just uh, my own personal opinion, wonder if this had something to do with the fact that she had only just moved back into her mother's home with this stepfather who was not her biological father, and did he not really want her there? Um, did something happen that morning or the night before? Was the mother's story of taking her and dropping her off at the school that morning made up? Or did someone really abduct this child and carry her ten miles away and beat her to death? was the motive to molest the child, but um, maybe they were stopped in their tracks by people being in the park and they didn't know what to do. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just speculating and wondering. I personally lean toward the home of the child, and that was where the police should have started, my personal opinion. But no one was ever arrested or charged, and as far as I know, there was never really any anybody that they leaned toward. I don't know what the police thought, if they thought that it could have been the parents, or if they really believed that she was abducted and beaten by some random person who just, you know, was in a bad mood that morning and decided to beat up a little girl. Nearly 50 years later, Tracy's slaying remains unsolved. Police hit a cement roadblock on day one and have never been able to move that needle. 
Her mother had dropped her off at St. Clara Catholic School where Tracy had been attending kindergarten, but the smiling little girl never made it to her classroom. Tracy was so happy all the time. She laughed and played all the time, her mother told the Toronto Sun in 1975. When she didn't come home for lunch, I went to the school to look for her, but no one had seen her all day. Sounds like Kyron Horman. You remember that case where the stepmother claims to have dropped him off at the school that morning and they did have a picture of him standing in the classroom, but he was never seen again. And people at the school say they don't know that it was the, that the picture of him was taken that day, that they're not sure that he was ever there that day. At about 12.30 p.m., police responded to a call from the Lakeshore Boulevard, the victim was discovered in Marie Curtis Park in a small body of water. She was suffering from medical trauma. She was transported to the hospital where she died shortly later. The cause of death was drowning, but Tracy had injuries consistent with a beating. They say she was not sexually assaulted. Did they do a rape kit? I know she was five years old, but why would someone just have taken a little five-year-old girl and just beat her to death and leave her to drown in a creek? Was it some kind of retaliation against one or both of her parents or... Now, some people believe that both of these children were the victims of a serial killer. Somewhere, a murderer has escaped justice for four decades. There was no such thing as social media, and the sad story of her murder was played out in the newspapers and on the TV. Within a year, it was, unheard, it was not heard of again at all. Just another unsolved murder for the records. Toronto Police Sergeant Brian Borg took to Twitter, now this was in 2014, took to Twitter to announce that he was now using social media as a tool to investigate more than 550 unsolved murders, using anniversaries of the murders and birthdays of the victims. The homicide detective plans to tweet the details of each one. Tracy's murder was first. Detective Sergeant Steve Smith of the Toronto Police told the Toronto Sun that they have DNA in the little girl's slaying. The family, okay, here's another scenario. Is it possible, just like some people suggested in the other story, that the child was never taken to the school that morning? She was beaten to death at home, beaten, and then taken out to the park, dressed as though she had been taken to school, put in this creek, and, and the mother comes up with this story that I dropped her off at the schoolhouse that morning. That's, that's a scenario that a lot of people have talked about on here. 13-year-old Mark Norrie was playing in the park when he saw a little girl lying face down in the creek. He ran home to get his mother, who called the police. Officers responded very quickly, and at around 1 p.m. attempted mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but Tracy was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. The official cause of death was drowning, but post-mortem showed a number of injuries consistent with physical assault. She was not sexually assaulted. This is what makes me and probably some of these people that have been talking about this in the comment section question if she was beaten to death by one or both of the parents because sexual assault would be pro pro more probable from a, someone who abducted a little girl um, because why would they just take a child and then beat it to death and leave it in the creek. 
unless they were just some kind of sick, twisted, crazy person. Her mom was taken to the hospital to identify her. I told them it couldn't be Tracy, but when I went in and they pulled the sheet back, I could see that it was her. A month later, a story featured in The Sun questioned whether there was a child killer responsible for the deaths of Tracy and another little girl as well as the disappearance of three other children in the Toronto area that year. Tracy was just a tiny doll of a child, only three foot tall, weighing about 45 pounds. She had black curly hair that she wore in braids. She was dressed in a gray cloth coat with a blue turtleneck and blue paints. It was terrible. I see nothing here that indicates to me that the family were suspects. We didn't get very far with the investigation. A number of rewards were issued over time, but it did not provide us with any leads. Time is a friend in code cases because people change. So Borg is hoping that his tweets may jog someone's memory or lead someone to come forward with information. She had been taken there, police believe. She was, they believe she was abducted at the school or near the school. Says she was seen alive a few minutes before class started. Now, who was that by? Was that by the mother or someone at the school actually seen the mother bringing her there? Tracy was taken more than 10 miles across town and murdered in the creek. After you start thinking about this, how sad that it was, this child had lived her entire life from the time she was less than a year old up until just a few short months before she died. She had lived her life with her grandmother. I don't know what the reason was. The grandmother and the mother decided it was time for her to go back and live with her mother because her mother had a three-year-old child with this man. And so they'd been together for that full, at least three to four years before Tracy was returned to her mother's home. And within five months, she's dead. I don't know if they went and interviewed the grandmother or any other family members. I don't know if they interviewed anyone in the uh, husband's family to see if anyone had any information to give about any kind of domestic violence or anything that was going on inside the home. It could have been the mother that beat the child to death. I don't know, and I don't know that that's the case here. It could very well have been someone who who did abduct her. It's just strange that um, her whole life And then she returns to her mother's care, and then she dies in this brutal, horrible way. So maybe these code case detectives that are reopening these cases, they do say that they have DNA. I don't know what kind of DNA that they had. They said she wasn't sexually assaulted, so I don't know. But maybe one day they will do... You know, this DNA will be entered into some databases and they'll get a match and maybe they can find out the true story here, but they may never know. Thanks for watching.